Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled Pier Fishing for Citation Red Drum, and I'm going to be talking with Tim Chavez, uh, hangs out at Seaview Pier. He also has a YouTube channel that features Seaview Pier. It's Tim F. Chavez on YouTube. Again, fishing reports, big catches from Seaview Pier. And we're going to be talking about gear, we're going to be talking about bait, and then we're going to be talking about the whens and wheres for successful citation red drum fishing from the pier. Very much looking forward to it. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community since 2003. We've been bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and now here in our latest and greatest, the Fisherman's Post saltwater podcast series and it is in this podcast series that we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the north carolina coast and ask them to share with us their knowledge their insights on how to catch more fish more often albeit i think the higher goal is for you to grab your family and your friends and get out on the water spending more time together more often and i'm joined in this endeavor every episode every week with my podcast partner, Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. Welcome once again, Billy, another episode. What's up, Gary? Good to see you again, man. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, you're right. We're trying to get more people on the water, catching more fish more often. And then I, every time I hear that, I'm like, huh, I should probably try to do that sometime. <laughs> you you know? I should probably try to get on the water more. What am I doing? This podcast isn't <laughs> successful if it doesn't get you out on the water know, right? at all. <laughs> Yeah, that's part of it, you know. It's like whatever. It's like this. I can do my part. I can try to get yeah. on the water for both of us. I can try every opportunity yeah. to go fishing. Which I bet you. Uh, yeah, I bet. I'm not gonna ask you how many fishing trips you've been on this year, but I know. Oh it's, man, I I've been on some good ones. This has been a good year. You have spent. You know, all these guys say it's time on the water, so you should be like a professional, totally professional. You should be a guide, actually. I'm a prote- professional <laughs> guide client i mean i get on that <laughs> boat and i say well, what do i cast and where do i cast it sir <laughs> and I, i'll tell you i'll tell you another question that i think comes from experience fishing with guides I'll, i usually throw this question out before before meeting them. i'm like hey man am i putting my cooler of food and drink on your boat or you want me to put my food and drink in a cooler you already have on the boat I think that's very courteous of me because some captains like the boat laid out a certain way and they don't want my cooler on the boat. Yeah. So uh, you guys look for it. It's coming soon. Gary's uh, <laughs> etiquette of being the best guest on the boat that you can possibly be. It's going to be in a PDF form. It's going to be five bucks and he's going to ride it. I just committed you to it. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. uh, guest etiquette on the boat. There we go. Anyway, speaking of boats, we'll shout out to our sponsors of this show. We'll get started with R.A. Hitch here in the Apex area. Really appreciate uh, Chris and his team. They got, they got hitches, trailers, bike racks, so much more. And, uh, and to top it off, uh, Chris is a avid angler in the Atlantic Beach area and loves to fish, and so he's super stoked about this podcast and wants to support it. So go support R.A. Hitch. Uh, call him up, make the drive, whatever you need to do, um, and work out whatever you need to get them to help you out, get your gear ready. And, uh, and speaking of great gear, great boats, great people, great service parts, all this stuff uh, about boating that I don't have... <laughs> But I'm going to get one day because we're going to figure that out. But Marine Warehouse Center, I get a quick word from those guys, and we'll be right back here. At Marine Warehouse, we have everything. We have new boats. We have parts. We have accessories, new trailers. We have a complete service department with highly trained technicians. Anything you need to get out on the water, we have. At Marine Warehouse Center, as we've grown over the last few years, now have a large section of marine supplies from start to finish for all your boating needs. What I love about this region is to be able to get out on the water and also we love to be able to get you out on the water. The best part of working at Marine Warehouse is being able to get involved with the customers and share a love for the water. Man, get out on the water, create a relationship with Marine Warehouse Center, parts, service, sales, and you even got Terrell that'll tell you a joke. If if you're in the market for a joke, a (laughs) cheap joke, if you're in the market for a quality (laughs) boat or a cheap joke... Than Marine Warehouse uh, Center. Did he did he send you one this week? 
He didn't send me oh, one. Right. I actually I ran into him at Five oh. Guys. He was getting ready to drop twenty bucks on a burger, fries, mm. and a drink at Five Guys, which is oh. another story. That's uh, yeah. All right. But he yelled across the store, "Gary, I got a joke." And here it is again. This is Terrell's joke, not Gary's. Why is a commercial fisherman so stingy? Uh, this was a trend on uh, like thin ice. I don't know. It's not going politics. It's not? All not. right, all right, all right. Why is a commercial fisherman <laughs> so stingy? His work makes him sell fish. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Terrell. Good job, Terrell. I'm gonna give you a I'm gonna give you a high five for that one. Virtual high five. Way to go, Terrell. Oh man, that's so funny, Gary. Sell fish. Those those guys. Anyway, what else were we talking about? Fish photo me. I want fish you to photo. fish photo. I, I get so distracted by those jokes. And here's a fish photo. We got Caleb Barnhart from Rockwell, North Carolina with a 47 inch red drum cut on a sea mullet, uh a sea mullet head while fishing the Cape Lookout Surf. That is a big stinking fish. I bet that thing's probably in its 20s, 30s. How old are they when they're that big? You would have to ask someone other than me. Well, maybe maybe Tim will know because I sure don't know. I bet he does. I bet he does know. I'm going to, I mean, that's a question. I Billy submitted a question right there. I like it. There we go. The one and only of, ever, of the show right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know where else you can send in questions? You can send in questions at buymeacoffee.com slash fisherman's post and this is where you can interact with gary and i by buying us a cup of coffee that sounds so <laughs> that sounds horrible well, you can pay for us to be your friends no i'm just kidding so this is where you can support the show you support gary and i as creators uh and buy us a coffee and also send gary some ideas for the show he puts together and i don't think you've ever said this gary but thank you so much for working so hard to bring the great guests on do all the great interviews um yeah i mean you do a great job so I know you brag about how great we look on camera, but I never brag about how good of a job we do. So reward Gary by buying him a coffee, and uh, and don't forget about me. So man, I get it's amazing how excited I get over five bucks. But every time something comes in five ten bucks, man, I'm stoked for some reason. Yeah, man, it's there's fun. a thrill to getting appreciated in that venue. And it's a uh, yeah, and I think it's just like people interacting, right? Like that's one of the ways that we interact with our audience, and you know, YouTube comments and uh and reviews instagram all that stuff so you guys reach out to us let us know you're watching and if you have any show ideas feel free to drop them to us what do you want to hear what do you want to learn and we'll find the people to bring on and talk about it and tonight billy i need you to pay attention because you do not need a boat again we are talking about pier fishing for citation reds all you need is that car that you have and drive out to that pier and then you can even drive to sea view pier and i bet you tim will take care of you yeah. yeah, maybe not. Maybe around that crowd, he'll be embarrassed to be our. He's our friends on camera, but maybe if we showed up at Sea View, he. Yeah, the minute he know. the minute he saw me cast, he'd be like, "I don't know that guy." <laughs> don't know that guy. <laughs> you know what? Delete that episode. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Billy's best takeaway. Billy's best takeaway. When I come back from talking with Tim, and right now, let's introduce Tim. Tim Chavez hangs out at Sea View Pier. Has a YouTube channel that features Sea View Pier fishing reports, fishing. Great catches from Seaview Pier. Welcome back to the show, Tim Chavez. All right. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, man. Good to have you. Um, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation last year. Very much looking to it this year. Again, talking about gear, bait, when, where. But as is tradition on Fisherman's Post, you got a couple of questions to get through first. And the one, predictably, okay. is why should we listen to what you have to say about a big red drum from a pier? Oh, I've put uh, plenty of time chasing these big reds. It's like the best time of the year. Uh, so, yeah, you could uh, use some of my experience and, uh, and try to help you catch some fish for yourself. All right. I am. I tell you, I am excited for this topic. And I've got a pretty good fishing resume going, but missing from that resume is a big red drum from the pier. So I'm going to be paying a special attention to what you have to tell us. Question number two, typically a non-fishing related question and attempt at levity. And I think I mentioned when I read my question here, I must have been lazy that morning. I'm not overly impressed with it, but I don't have anything to fall back on. So here is your a attempt at levity question. Tim, can you name a famous person with the first name of Piers? 
uh, Morgan Pierce. Yeah, Pierce Morgan. You got it, man. Yeah, you got it. Pierce that was Morgan's the only good. one I came up with. And again, not <laughs> not very much levity, but at least we're through that segment. And let's get right on to you, man, because you got a wealth of knowledge. Um, we're talking about gear first, huh? So we need specific gear if we're going to successfully pull in a big red from the pier. Yeah, uh, uh, pretty much. You know, there's like, you know, you can use pretty much anything. There's like, you know, anything you could use. And there's like the ideal setup. So like, you know, you can get away with using any kind of a heavy uh, rod setup with, you know, a, a heavier reel, you know, school with 20 pound line because you can be throwing, you know, eight, 10 ounce weights or whatever it takes to hold the bottom. So when you look for these big reds rum, typically they're caught during a heavy storm conditions or rough conditions uh, until you get like towards October you know, then you could just catch them, you know, on a, on a, a typical weekends or weekdays, you know, with, a, you know, a lighter winds. But typically uh, eight, 10 ounce weights is what you can be thrown. You might be able to get away with six ounces on, on some days. But like I said, you know, a, a, a spinning rod for a heavy catfish would work fine. Uh, the ideal setup would be, you know, a, a for a rod would be, you know, a 8, 12, 13 foot rod, extra heavy setup. You know, the type of reel that you'd be using would be, you know, some kind of a small uh, a casting reel that you have spooled up like, you know, a 17 to 20 pound line. Uh, we typically, you know, is used like about 40 pound, 50 pound shock leader because we're throwing uh, uh, heavy weights. Uh, but you can get by with a spinning reel. Uh, but you'll, you'll notice if you go to the, the pier, when you're fishing, when people set the rod down, uh, uh, People get out of the way because other people are casting. And uh, what's nice about these uh, uh, bait reels is they have a clicker that you can turn on. So when you uh, put the loose drag and you have your rod at the, uh, rail, when the fish hits as he's taking a line up, you can hear it. You know, it makes a clicker sound, so you can you know the fish has got the bait and he's making a run. With a spinning rod, you might not notice it because they don't really make much sound. So that's why you know the ideal setup would be a nice casting rod with a bait caster. You know, compared to a spinning reel setup, but you could, you know, go out there and try it with a spinning reel setup. Uh, as in uh, the, uh, the type of hooks that we use. Well, we let, use, me, uh, let me hold you ahead. back. Let me talk about rods and reels for just a second. Sure. So you're saying with, the, with an effective shock leader, which you're going to explain because not everyone's going to know what that is, and we also want details even if we know what it is, but with a shock leader – then 20 pound mono is all I want, not braid. Is that correct? Yes. That's uh, yeah. You want to use a, a mono. You know, if you have braid, you, you will be the one causing the issues because a braid kind of clumps up and it, it doesn't, uh, it, it's when it gets entangled, it's real hard to get out. Uh, like for the line, you want it to be spooled up with some kind of mono, some kind of a bright, um, uh, high vis line because you will be fishing at night and it's a lot easier to get these high vis lines untangled compared to clear mono or braid because braid's really tough to get out when it when when it's in a tangle and so also, part of uh, it too is just like i guess respect for the other anglers because braid can more quickly mess up your neighbors and then you're then you're that guy on the pier is that part of this yes that is correct also uh, it could cut off other people's fish. When you do come tight or people are running their mono across your braid, you could be breaking other people's fish off because mo- you know everyone will be fishing mono, so you will end up being that guy. You will not only be causing tangles, you'll be causing a, a, you know, a, a, a cutoffs. And so 20 pound, I don't need anything heavier, but how, how much 20 pound would be the minimum that I would have on my reel to feel confident I can handle what comes my way. Oh, you will, you know, uh, if you're using like these 20, uh, you know, like Saltus BG 20 or a uh, fathom 15, these uh, casting reels pulled it with a 20 pound line, most likely you wouldn't be able to cast all the line out. So there's plenty of line that you can get a far cast and you still have plenty of line to fight the fish with. Some, some people might drop down to 17 to get a little more distance, but you know, uh, if you go to like 25, then you might not have enough line on your spool to uh, be able to get a little long cast and also have enough line to fight the fish. And if ideal is a 12 to 13 foot rod heavy duty, then what would be, you, Tim saying, man, you really can't go shorter than this. 
Uh, like I said, you know, anything that you can bring in a big, you know, 30, 40, 50 pound catfish in any of your, you know, river catfish setups, you know, those will work fine. You know, you just don't want to come out with some, you know, little six foot rods pulled up with 15 pound line with 3000 reel because you'd hook into a big old fish, the current and, you know, the size of the fish will be keeping away from the pier. You have an extended battle, you know, you could tire the fish out since they're going to be released. You know, the intention is, do you know, Get them in kind of fairly quick, you know, get a picture if that's your intention, get them back in the water so they're released to play another day. So, you know, you want to come with, you know, some gear that, you know, you can handle, you know, 20, 30 pound fish, get them in and, and get them released. Although you can come out with a small setup, you know, you, you might end up, you know, killing some fish and, you know, that's, you know, not in the spirit of it because, you know, it is a catch and release fishery. So, you know, you want to be geared up to where, you know, you can get them in, and get them back you know, health. All right. Um, I think I cut you off when you're getting ready to start talking about hooks, but um, I guess this is our terminal tackle conversation or rig conversation. That's right. And I, I do want you to talk about the shock leader though. I, I mean, I, I think that's a key part and I mean, I'm, you probably were anyway, but maybe we work our way down towards the end. Yes, definitely. That's definitely. So, so like I said, you know, we got, we got the line, it's pulled up a 20 pound line and then, uh, People put uh, enough line on the shock leader to where, you know, they could drop their weight back as you typically do in a hatter's cast where they could uh, have a couple loops on the spool and they could get their thumb on it. So when they cast it out, all the weight of the eight ounce weight is all on the shock leader. And once you cast it out, let it go, your shock leader comes off, then that pulls off your 20 pound line. So you got a lot of line and you can get the distance on it. But the shock is just there so that way you can throw the heavy, you know, eight or 10 ounce weight. You know, sometimes they go with 12s, but if it gets to the point where you need 12 ounce weight the whole bottom, most likely I'll I'll wait for another day or I'll wait for the wind to slow down some. You know, 10, 10 ounces, you know, about my limit, 10 in bait. Your standard shock leader is made with what with what test? And and uh, instead uh, of just a couple wraps, man, give me a give me a length, man. I'm I'm a sucker for me, specifics. Me, the way I, I spool mine up, I have enough to where I got like three or four wraps on my spool and also I can have the fish in the water so that way I I know when I get the shock leader onto my spool I'm on the shock leader and I could use you know the thicker line to horse the fish into the net so that's how much shock leader I use some people they use you know they got the rods 12 foot with the drop so they're using about like 20 feet of shock leader to where I'm more using more like, you know, 40, 45 feet. You know, it's like I said, I got like three or four wraps on the spool and the fish is still in the water. So I could hoss it to the net, you know, get them in, boom, release them, drop it back in the water, I can throw it back out. And also each cast, you want to check your shock leader because there are sharks, you get nicks, you want to make sure if there's any, you know, roughness to the line, either change your shock leader or cut it off and retie on that spot, and then you're good to cast for the next cast. Fifty pound mono, like clear mono. Are you actually doing fluoro? And and what about is there a standard knot that you used to attach? Yeah, uh, 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 use a, a spider hitch to a no name knot, and I use um, uh, oh, actually this is a sixty pound. This what I was using to uh do my leaders, but uh, the shock lead I just use Trilon Big Game a uh, uh, fifty. Uh, so some people use, actually, that's a full of 30, but uh, I use 40. Some people use 50 because you know, uh, people who throw real hard, they could actually throw it so hard, they could break the eight ounce weight off with 40 pound test. And I know uh, when they have the uh, long distance casting competitions, minimum shock leader that you have is 50 pound. So, you know, 40 or 50, you know. You throw real hard, you probably should go with 50. You know, I don't throw super hard, so I get away with 40. And then what is at what is after the shock leader? So what's the first thing that touches the end of the shock leader? Oh, uh, after you come off the shock leader, then uh, you're going into your terminal tackle. Okay. So you're going to have, you know, uh, you're going to have a, a, a little red bead. You're going to have a swivel, which is you're going to have your hook, weight hooked up to. And then you're gonna have a, a, a barrel swivel, and then you're gonna have your hook. And uh, where the swivel is, sometimes people have like a plastic piece that they put there, and they put the weight on the plastic piece. 
I would not recommend using a plastic piece that holds an eight ounce weight because as soon as you throw any kind of force on it, a little plastic piece is going to break. Weight's going to fly one way and it could cause an a, a issue. Also, the swivel that you want to use for the weight, you want to make sure that it's a coastal lock swivel. Swivels that they, um, you can you see where it's the wire wraps all the way around the, uh, uh, the long part. So that way it's physically locked in there. There's no way that the weight could uh, pull it off. If you got one of those generic brass swivels with the little metal flange that's uh, holding the lip and you throw it real hard, that thing could straighten out and your weight could come flying off and that could cause an issue. So you definitely want to have a coast lock swivel, one bead, barrel swivel. And uh, people have a different variation of the length between the hook and the barrel swivel. You know, most people make them a lot shorter. Mine's kind of longer, I guess. Uh, so that way, you know, if a shark gets in there, they could, you know, easily bite it off and I can keep my weight. Uh, some people, they don't use the barrel swivel. So they just, you know, have a, a bead and a swivel and it rests right on the weight. But the issue with that is every time you get a shark, you're going to always lose your weight. At least the setup, you know, if they do bite the hook off, you know, at least you get to keep your weight. So what's and, the uh, if, what's the purpose of that bead if that if that bead is on the on the shock leader that's like twenty to forty feet why why the bead on the long side of the swivel? It is so that to keep the uh, weight from riding up the line. Okay. So that way uh, it, it keeps together as as a piece, both when it's flying in the air and then when it's sitting in the water, and also so when other people are reeling up lines, uh, your weight don't catch into other people's lines, but it's it's intended to keep the weight not sliding up the line so it's to keep the weight uh, close by the hook so you don't get tangles and i think you said that leader is what 60 pound mono is that what you grabbed before yes the uh, the hook I mean, the hook and the barrel swivel is a uh, 60 pound some people use 80 but you know i use 60 so that way the sharks easily bite it off if you use uh anything lower than 40 the red drums got you know the crusher plates and you know it could abrasion up the line so with the roughness of the mouth you know i tend to go with 60. and then why that particular hook it's both size and style uh circle hooks are kind of nice you know uh they kind of self uh set themselves gets right in the corner of the mouth this is a nine aught hook uh typically you know i use between a eight and to ten odd hook <laughs> excuse me oh uh, when uh uh i'm fishing around local you know, uh, Onslow Bay area, I, I tend to use a uh, eight or a nine knot when I uh, travel up north, you know, to Outer Banks area, because they do have a larger class of fish up that way. You know, I, I tend to use like a nine or a 10 knot hook. Uh, sometimes I use a J hooks, but uh, typically I, I use a circle hooks. It's just kind of tend to eat easier fish that way. You could throw it out. As soon as they're making a run, you can pick up your rod, tighten up the drag, and, and it's hooking itself pretty much. And some people like the, the thrill of, you know, getting up there, thumbing it, you know, setting the hook a couple of different times, you know, making it, you know, giving it and then, you know, it's, it's fun. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I tell you, I mean, sincerely, it is high, high on my list. I don't know if there's anything actually higher on my list right now, man. Uh, so that, unless you have something to follow up with gear, you know, I always like to set up and say anything you didn't get quite to say on gear, I guess we'll move on to bait. Yeah. The, the only th other thing that on gear that, you know, I did mention would be, you know, uh, a way to get the fish up because you know we are targeting fish that are you know 15 20 30 pounds and obviously ain't going to reel it up over the side so you're going to need some kind of a drop net uh some piers like Jeanette's pier actually has a pier net you know so people who are fishing can use their pier net so uh, you might need to check with the pier that you're going to be fishing with you know see if they provide a net or you might have to bring your own net if you don't have a net then either you're gonna have to walk it to the beach or hope that someone is there fishing with a you know pier net that could you know help you out and get your fish I'm going to guess that the chances are slight if I'm out there during red, big red drum season that somebody out there doesn't have a net. Are people generally nice enough to share, help out, or is it like, no, dude, where's your net? Hey, you know, since it is catch and release fishery, you know, you know, it is fun. People are out there, you don't know, have a good time. So, you know, we're all helping each other to try to land our fish because, you know, we're all, you know, want to catch the fish and, you know, it's the camaraderie of being with people, you know, everyone having fun and everyone catching fish. 
All right, good, because I don't want to buy a net. I just want to come out and depend on the kindness of strangers. That's what I want. That's it. See, if, if there's a few people out there, most likely, you know, there's gonna be some hardcore drum guys and and they have some nice net ups where you may get multiple fish in the in the net. Well, what about bait, man? I'm guessing that's pretty key. I'm guessing that is as paramount to success as anything. Yeah, bait, you know, uh there's uh it's kind of like a match the hatch situation. So like in the beginning of you know the summer, or actually not the you know, more of the beginning of the fall. You got uh, the hardhead mullet, the finger mullets that are swimming down the beach, and that's what kicks off the uh, the drum season. The big reds start coming in when the bait starts moving down the beach. So that's the first chance you got when, I'd say when you got, after about two weeks of a constant mullet flow, swimming down the beach, swimming down the beach, swimming, that's enough time. Those big reds, they're offshore. They, they kind of sense it. They smell it in the water, or they know it's that time of season because you got the northeast winds blowing. You know, maybe a tropical storm or you got some tropical swell coming in. They they know it and they start coming into the beach. So when you two weeks in that first mullet run, that's when you got a chance to start catching them. And of course, the bait you want to use during that time is is mullet. You get the mullet, big chunks of mullet work the best. Heads work good also. But uh, uh, then then using the bait, you know, uh, the best way to do it is uh, is set a timer. So you go out there, get a chunk of mullet, fresh cut mullet works the best, but the pickers like eating it off your hook. So you so what you do is put a piece of bait out there, you throw it out there, you set alarm for like 10 minutes. Wait 10 minutes, you reel in your bait, you see how it looks. If you ain't got no bait on your hook, then you need to drop the alarm to maybe eight minutes, seven minutes. Ask to back out there, see how your bait looks. You reel it up, you still got some bait on your hook, and that's probably about a good time frame because the pickers are there eating their bait off your hook. But if it's so, say the first time you throw it out there, it waits 10 minutes, you really you still got good bait. Well, just keep that 10 minutes, you know, or maybe a little bit, leave it a little bit longer. Find the sweet spot to where, you know, you still got a little bit of bait on your hook, but, you know, you're not reeling it up with the empty hooks. So that way, you know, that you're, you know, you got, you're, you're spending time with bait on your hook in the water, you know, uh, when when there's heavy winds or there's like a hurricane or tropical storm coming by, the bait pickers aren't that bad because you know they can't really get on your bait because there's so much current that they really can't stay on it. So it gives time for a big fish to come by, find it, and get on you. But otherwise, like I said, uh, you know you just need to uh, set a time, check your bait often, uh, see the rate of the bait pickers, then you know adjust from there. Uh, also, sometimes uh, when the fish is crowded, say, you know, like there's a run happening, there's like a dozen people or 20 people fishing, you know, you got to take turns casting. Uh, sometimes I, I, I might switch to uh, fishing fish heads, you know, just big mullet heads, throw it out there. Since the bait pickers really can't take them off the hook, you got more time where you, your bait can sit in the water. So you can set your, uh, your time to like 15, 20 minutes, you know, so that way, you know, you, you got you, you're you got more time in the water without needing to wait for casting, so you got more opportunities of catching fish. And then, as there's less, <clears throat> as as less people get on the pier, or you know, people go home, or whatever, there's less people fishing, like you know, seven or less. Then I'll switch back to bait chunks because the bait chunks are the better bait. But you have to go through, you know, you got to cast more often, go and check your bait more often, make sure that you know you're not just fishing with the empty hook. All right, so clearly you're a guy that has given just about every detail in the process some thought. So what I'm going to ask you now is to, is to swing back around and to help me out a little bit more than just putting a chunk of bait on the hook. Like, what is the ideal size of that chunk, or is it just cutting the bait down the middle? Is it going through the skin? I mean, anything that you can share, because I know it's I know you've given it more thought than just putting a chunk of bait on the hook and casting it out. And then I guess also on the fish heads, is it just through the lips and out? I mean, okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, you know, you got the bait long ways, you cut it, you know, long ways. Uh, uh, I guess the size of the bait would be uh, no bigger than a golf ball. Uh, you know, cause the, normally the size of mullet that I like, you know, cause I, I cast net my own mullet, you know, I hang out on the pier, wait for the schools of mullets to come by and, I try to selectively cast net the schools I like, and the schools I like are about the size of corn cobs. So when you cut the piece of bait, they're about like a 
one inch, one and a quarter inch uh, thick. So you end up with, you know, a piece that's about the size of a golf ball. Uh, if, if, you know, I end up with the, like, the bigger mullets, you know, because they do have those bigger, like, you know, two foot, you know, one foot, two foot, big old horse mullets. If I have those, then I'd use a, a, a nine or 10 odd hook because, you know, you have bigger bait chunks. So, you know, I'd use the bigger hook. When I'm using the, the cob mullets, then that's when I use the eight or the nine odd circle hooks. And uh, for the fish head, you know, you just, uh, you, you want to hook it like through, deep through the jaw. And you want to come out like uh, through its forehead. There's like a big solid spot. Boom, right through that solid spot to make sure that the crabs can't pull that head off, you know. And uh, that's a solid piece of bait that stays on. Um, that's good, man. What about um, what about something other than – is there a scenario where you're using anything other than mullet? Or is you mullet is really as far as we need to go with bait? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's, it's like I said, you know, it's a matched hatch type season. So, you know, like I said – Start out with the mullet, you know, because that's what's running down the beach. And as you get into where the water temperature starts dropping down below 72, 70 degrees or so, then you start getting the big spot runs. When the spot runs start happening, then you can start using spot heads or spot bodies for uh, for bait. Uh, I, I, I tried fishing the pier while spot runs have been happening, and I have not had really good luck catching big drums while the spot runs like full blown spot run. If they're like catching two, three spots at a time, you might not catch any drum because the bait is just so thick. They're just not finding your bait. So that's probably the best time for you to catch spots so that way you could, you know, prepare for fishing for the next day or the day after. So like one or two days after a spot run is really good for drum, drum fishing for big reds using spots, using either the bodies or the heads. All right, man, that's good. I, I'm enjoying this. I've heard of spot heads. Certainly mullet is a standard, and uh, I, I like that. Uh, again, I'll do the old anything less to, anything left to say about bait, and then, you know, tell me about the whens and the wheres. Yes, uh, oh, oh. They, they do have a limit for spot. There's only 50 spot per person, and we did talk to the fishing game guy. We said, you know, say if we're out here and, you know, we got all this bait in the cooler and you come up on us, and how, how are you going to handle it? He said, well, if we just have a bunch of fish heads in our tents for fishing, then, you know, we're good to go. But if he comes up and he sees like, you know, we have like 60 full bodied spot, then, you know, that says he, we might have an issue because he's not sure for fishing or for keeping them to eat consumption. So, uh, you know, he says, if you got a bunch of fish heads, you're good to go. If you're going to have some bodies in there, you got to make sure that you're under your limit. So, and then also, uh, when, uh, you know, at, like I said, around 70, you know, six, below 74 degrees, we do have a, a menhaden that come through the beach, you know, or big pods of menhaden. If you get fresh menhaden, you know, coming through as the schools of menhaden are coming through, that also works. Uh, pinfish, uh, sand perch, ribbon fish, red drum are opportunistic. You know, so, you know, you got these schools of mullet, they come through. There's bluefish that follow these schools. They eat them up. What's normally left, you know, after the bluefish school comes through is, you know, the uh, heads and tails and the red drum just readily come through. Cleaning house behind the, the bluefish do all the work. Red drum come through, clean up house, picking up all the uh, heads and tails, you know, that the bluefish leave behind. So that's why I think uh, the uh, red drum are red, easily caught on fish heads is because that's the natural lay of the bait. Mullet comes swimming through, bluefish attack them, they eat the bodies out, the heads hit the bottom, red drum come up, eat them. And later in the season, we get the big uh, spot runs, spots are coming through, bluefish attack the bodies, the heads hit the bottom, big red drum come up and eat up the heads. And then same, same with the mullet. I mean, uh, same with the menhaden. You know, you just got schools of menhaden, bluefish and Spanish are chunking them down. They don't really eat the heads too much. The heads hit the bottom. Red drum or being opportunistic in cleaning house and feeding. Is there any scenario where you're throwing out a live bait? Uh, it's not needed, but uh, there was you know one time where we did where we were throwing live baits. It's just because uh, it was the day after a hurricane came through, Hurricane Michael. Uh, we we're looking at the pier. It had power. Uh, uh, the power lock got lost in the pier. 
we had a bunch of bait in the tank. So uh, we decided to use the uh, bait fresh out of the tank, you know, uh, just whack the tail off, put it on the hook, throw it out there. And uh, we did uh, end up catching or uh, releasing a hundred red drum that night. It was one of the banner nights. And you attribute that number more to the conditions, not the difference in bait choice, but that the it, fall on the score. Yeah, it, it was it was the conditions. It was a uh, it was a tropical storm that was coming up. It was actually a hurricane that was coming up the coast. It was uh, damaging the piers. We we're thinking, you know, uh, you know, our pier might not be looking good, you know, because uh, it, it was damaging them along the way. But I think it jogged off the coast. Uh, we just had, you know, some ground swell as it came through the. Sea view was closed. We went there the morning to assess the damage. The waves were big enough to where it was hitting the boards on the bottom because at least uh, nine boards at the very end were like knocked up out of the spots. Uh, uh, so I, I did meet the pier owner there that morning when we assessed the damage. Wind was blowing like 40 miles straight off the beach. Ocean was flat calm. We did catch like, you know, a, a, a dozen or so the day before. I was kind of wondering, you know, if they're still around. I threw out a line within like seven minutes. I was hooked up to like 42 inch. Threw out another line, got a 48 inch on the deck. Started calling up all my buddies. Said, tonight's the night. If you could get out here and you're not flooded in, you need to get on the pier because tonight's going to be the night. Sure enough, guys who actually got on the pier that night, like I said, we, we released over 100 red drum up to 50 inches that night. It's like the typical, you know, topsail island fish. You know, we, might get them up to 48 inches every now and then we might see a 50 but once you go up to like the outer banks you know 50 inch fish is common or you know you, know, you can't see 50 inch fish work you know possibly to get up to 60. so you, know, you go up north once you get up past uh, uh, cape lookout uh or uh cape hatter right like, nice no, uh and yeah, it is cape lookout or uh you know the, the fish are a bigger class fish up there you know onslow bay and, you know, South, South Carolina, you know, or the typical fish is like, you know, 48 inches, you know, up to 48 inches. Well, what else can you tell me about conditions, man? No, I don't want to send people out. I don't want people waiting for a hurricane to go and try this out. I, what else? Tell me yeah, more uh, about uh, the when and the where that, I mean, I'm with you and you're speaking yeah, truth. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, so, so like I said, you know, you, you do have your first chance to start catching them when the uh, mullet first start running, which is like uh, middle of August, you know, it's all water temperature driven so it's not really a calendar date can't really point to a date on the calendar but you know when the water temperature gets below 74 degrees you start getting the chance of getting them when it gets down to 70 68 degrees the chances are even better you know by the time it gets down to 66 you should be doing really good and then uh by the time it gets into like november you know uh the chances of catching them start getting slimmer and slimmer but uh like the best time is october the month of October, you can pretty much, you know, northeast winds, you know, that's what you want. You want mi migratory winds, like the predominant winds in the spring or southwest, which blows the water up the coast. The predominant winds in the fall are uh, northeast, which blow the winds, or which blows the water down the coast. So anytime you get the migratory winds, which are northeast or north winds, those are the ones you can catch the red drum on, you know, so, so. So anytime you get any kind of good northeast wind days, those are when you want to be out there and, and fish that night and you probably catch some real nice red drum. You know, so sometimes, you know, you might have to fish until it might bite like one tide or one section of the tide. And then the next night you might be able to get them the same part of the tide. Sometimes they'll bite the whole tide. Sometimes, you know, they might not bite. That's why so it's fishing. And so with the winds, it isn't even just the direction, but you like it sloppy out there. Like you want enough wind to churn it up. Is that true for this fishery? Uh, in October, if you have two, you know, like they say, like you're up at the outer banks, and once the wind gets above 20 knots, there's too much current and it's too rough. So, you know, a, a typical easy wind day, like, you know, 10 to 20 knots, you know, 10, 15, you know, those, those are good wind days, northeast, you know, and you're catching fish. Or, uh, like, if you're talking Onslow Bay, uh, you know, the piers, like, you know, uh, the topsail piers, then you probably need a little bit more rougherness, you know. But typically, you know, 15 to 20 knot winds from the northeast, you're doing good. Or, or any kind of a tropical system coming in or a hurricane that is passing by offshore. 
It has to, it has to be a system that's offshore that is giving us a good ground swell but where we're getting a lot of northeast wind on it. If we get like a, a, a tropical system or a hurricane that passes by inside of us, we get a lot of south southwest winds. And that that really doesn't bring the red drum in for some reason. They uh, they like a northeast wind. Anything that that blows a strong northeast wind, they know that's the migratory wind for some reason, and it triggers them, and they come in. They come in to feed. So, so all this fishing has happened out on the very end of the pier. You know, this is at the end of the pier, not up and down the pier. And earlier on, we talked about gear and we talked about long casts. So is the long cast because the fish are passing by that far off the pier and need to reach them? Or is the long cast about me getting my bait to them before your cast, which isn't as long? It's a combination of a little bit. It's like as you go up north, uh, there's more of a sandbar. You're trying to get at the other side of the sandbar so that we're fishing in the deeper water where the fish are. And as you head down south, you don't have to really worry about a sandbar so as long as you're getting in the water, you're doing good. But since they're, uh, you know, a larger size fish, and if you're dropping it straight over the side of the pier, it's going to be kind of hard to catch because, you know, he's going to be wrapping the pylons, going here, going there. But if you could throw it out, you know, at least you could tire them out before you get them back so that we get them to the net easier. So the further you get out, you know, the more, you know, you got to play him so that way he's most likely going to get in the net a little easier. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, you know, uh, Distance does matter. You see the dudes that are bombing way out there. They're catching the fish and you might not. But then there are the times where the dudes that are doing the little short cast, you know, because they you know, can't get that far. Boom, there's lopping out there and they're catching the fish. And then you notice some of the dudes that are bombing out there. Also, they're not casting as far. Then they start catching the fish too. So, so you know, sometimes it's just, you know, how the fish are, are moving through. And, uh, but sometimes, you know, they, they are out deep, you know, Obviously, as you know, the tide's coming in and the you know, top of the tide, you got more water uh, pushing on the beach and, the, and they'll be in a little closer compared to when it's the bottom of the tide where like the water's pulling off the beach and they might be a little further out. And if this is, if the north and northeast wind is the hot wind, does that mean the north side of the pier is the hot side of the pier? Uh, not necessarily because, uh, uh, yeah, you know, different piers kind of face in different directions. Uh, like Sea View, the northeast wind is kind of like at your back. So, you know, you kind of help you cast a little further because, you know, the wind's kind of taking you out there. Or like, you know, the Jolly Roger, the wind's more kind of like towards the side of your, side of your face, kind of. So, you know, it depends on the angle of the pier. And uh, I guess, so what, what else as far as, I mean... I don't know what to ask. I know one question I want to ask, but I feel like I might be jumping the gun. The question I want to ask is like, man, every pier has their culture. It has their regulars. And so some people watching this podcast are thinking, man, I do want to try this, but they might be a little intimidated about going out there with a network of people that know each other very well. And they're clearly the new person. So help, help me get over it. Or what advice can you give people like me that would say, Man, come on out. This is how this is how you would approach it. This is what you would do when you walk out to the end of the pier. Yeah, uh, s different piers kind of have it a little different. You know, some are just like a free for all. You know, and and some you know have posted rules where you know you need to step out of the area when someone's casting. You know, and, and then there are you know the drum etiquette rules for someone who's drum fishing. You know, the you know they know the certain things. So if if you're a new person and you never went to drum fishing before. Like one of the things that, uh, that you got to realize is uh, uh, that it's one person at a time is going to be casting. So, you know, if you reel up your bait, you don't want to stand there on the rail and rebate. You know, you want to bring it back to your pier cart, put a new piece of bait on, and then come up, get in line, and make it cast out. So, you know, uh, uh, it would be kind of like a little flow of things, you know, uh, and, and most of the rules are posted. So you, you just look at the rules and, uh, Sometimes, you know, people kind of get intimidated as, uh, you know, they see people casting out far and they might show up with a spinning rod. Like I said, you know, that, that's fine. Just, you know, uh, as long as you got mono on and you're manning your rod and working with guys, you know, it, it'll, it'll turn out good. And then am I just leaning my rod up against the side of the rail? Uh, yeah, yeah. You want to, uh, well, like I said, you, you loosen your drag because these are bigger fish and when they hit the bait. They're gonna take it and they're gonna go. If you have if you have your drag tight, 
basically your rod is going to flip up over the rail and you can't really you know stand on the rail the whole time because someone might cast so you're going to need to step away when you step away you're going to have to loosen your drag so you know but uh, typically like i said you know the ideal setup is is like you know a bait casting reel to where you can turn a clicker on and 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 when the fish runs it you're gonna, you're gonna hear the clicking sound you know it's gonna about you know make, then you can walk up uh, tighten up your drag and then, then you're fighting the fish man uh i know we could keep on talking but we're at the end of our podcast so tim this is final thoughts time man what, how are we going to wrap this up okay um I guess it's just uh you just got to go out there and you know so, sometimes it, it's luck sometimes you know it's following the reports but uh mostly uh, it's 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 being there when they're biting and 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 you know that's going to happen is it's, it's mostly all wind driven so if you're there when the winds are right you're going to catch your fish you know, so say like you know a tropical storm is going to come in you can look at the the weather pattern and if it's passing by offshore in the period that you want to fish, whether it be Johnny Mercer's, you know, Apache, you know, uh, a Sea View, you know, uh, one of the piers up north, you know, if, if it's giving you a lot of the northeast wind, that's what you want to plan your days around. You know, in in the, the spring, you really don't really catch many drum off the piers. It's more, mostly a uh, fall fishing. So you want to target the days that are, uh, Oh, with a lot of northeast winds, you know, north is 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 not too bad, but northeast wind that is is literally where the bite's at. And why is night so much better than day? Uh, at at, at the nighttime, for one thing, uh, the kingfisher guys most likely will be occupying the end of the pier because uh, uh, when the drum fishing comes on, is is the tail end of kingfishing. So at nighttime, you know, obviously the uh, end of the pier is open and at night, the pickers aren't so bad. The pinfish don't eat your bait up as bad. So it gives you know, your, your bait a chance to, to be laying there for a red drum to come by and find it. All right, Tim. So once again, the Tim F. Chavez YouTube channel with all kinds of sea view pier updates, both fishing reports and large catches. Um, Tim, you know, and sea view pier is your home pier. You know, it's where you frequent. Um, thank you so much, man. Um, I'm excited, man. I'm again. I, I, maybe this is my year. I realize it. I just got to commit. I'm not a late night person. I got to dig in. I guess. That's right. Just come on out. And we'll get you on a big old red drum. Right on, man. Thanks, Tim. No problem. Billy, dude, he got me fired up, man. Right? He got me fired up. He got me fired up, dude. You can tell when he's getting fired up, and then. You know, that, um, I just, you know, when you heard his drag go off, I'm like, how many people that is triggered that's listening to this? <laughs> they're just like, oh, they're like, oh my gosh, where's that? Yeah, that's great, man. Man, and that peer wow. crowd is a good time, man. Yeah. Like, it's full of characters. And so, even, you know, I mean, you got to be actively fishing. You can't just, you know, shut it down. Mm -hmm. Man, there are several reasons why. I want to spend some nights on the it pier. Seems like a fun crowd chasing the it big seems red like a drum. Fun crowd, yeah. I mean, especially when you're like, of course, you know. I know it's one of those rare nights, but a hundred plus red drum that are like forty five plus inches or fifty. I mean, I'm insane. like, gosh, dude, that'd be insane to be. You know, I mean, I've had. I think you and I were on the boat together when I caught a forty eight inch drum or something, and it was like. This is so sick. So to catch multiples in one night would be insane. Yeah, and even just be around it. Yeah. It doesn't have to be your rod, but just seeing that happen and being a part of it on any level. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be is, cool. Are we calling that your best takeaway? Uh, no, my best takeaway is the northeast wind, man. He said it. He said it and said it and said it. And I'm like, if somebody can't get that one thing, <laughs> you are you don't need to be out there. You're not paying attention. You're not paying attention because he said it so many times. I'm like, this has to be important because he's telling us, you know, check that northeast wind. And uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's kind of like sur I, I produce a surfing podcast and all those guys go out when there's a hurricane. So I'm like, all right, surf, surfing and surf fish or uh, pier fishing. <laughs> there you go. Well, I, I yeah. am. I have a renewed <laughs> interest, man. Maybe, maybe yeah. this is my, I got to find, I got to be able to put some nights together because to go out one night and expect it to happen seems a little bit optimistic. I like being optimistic, yeah. but just have think, a little cup of sweet tea about 8 30 at night. Find, and it'll set I just got to free up a schedule <laughs> where I can put in like three nights, four nights in a row and like really lock in. Yeah. Oh, that'd be cool. Or just put a, you know, Tim will put you on speed dial, man. He starts hitting them. You just jump in the car and go. Well, call me when right. you got one hooked up and I'll reel it in. 
I mean, that's that's how you that's how you fish on a boat. So you might as well fish on a beer that way. Tim, I'll be up there in twenty minutes. Just hold it. <laughs> Let it run. Leave the drag loose. <laughs> Gosh, that's funny, Gary. I, you know, I wouldn't put it past you. No. <laughs> oh, man. Wrap it up. All right. Well, we appreciate our sponsors for this episode, R.A. Hitch and Marine Warehouse Center. Uh, so if you aren't pier fishing, you're boat fishing, make sure you're getting your boat and all your boat supplies and boat needs taken care of by Marine Warehouse Center. And if you need a hitch to haul that boat around, go call R.A. Hitch. So there you go. Support those guys. They support us. And head over to buymeacoffee.com slash Fisherman's Post and drop us some coffee and drop us some show content that you would like to see because we'd like to do that for you. So we'll see you next episode.